Good evening and welcome to a Friday night edition of Tisky Sour. I'm Michael Walker and I am joined as ever by Aaron Bastani, contributing editor at Navarra Media and co-founder of this very organization. How are you doing? I'm very, I'm extraordinarily well. How are you, Michael? Uh, very well. You've had sort of like a quite a big week publishing, you know, exclusives about that, that Labour leaky doc. I've made a lot of enemies. That later in the show. You've made, yeah, a made, a, made a lot of enemies. Uh, we are also very lucky to be joined tonight by Dr. Sonia Adesara. Um, Hello. Hiya. Sonia is a GP registrar. You've also been working as a, an A&E doctor during this crisis, am I right? Um, <laughs> um, a, a, apologies to our viewers for our slightly late start tonight. We had some technical problems, but everything is my, in order my fault. now. No, to be honest, I had to leave the stream and come back in as well. It was, you know, everything goes wrong all at the same time, doesn't it? Um, if you are, well... You, you obviously are watching this show. Can you please share it on your channels? Because we want to get more people in here. So share the link and tweet all through the show on the hashtag Tisky Sour. Um, the stories we're going to discuss tonight are, firstly, um, the issue of coronavirus affecting most seriously uh, people of ethnic minorities in this country. So a disproportionate number of, of people from ethnic minorities finding themselves in, in ICUs and, and dying from, from COVID-19. We're then going to talk about the crisis in personal protective equipment and why the government still haven't managed to sort it out. Um, then we're going to let Sonia go and me and Aaron are going to talk about labour leaks um, and an interview that Keir Starmer did yesterday. You know, the standard Tisky Sour affair. <laughs> um, but to our first story. So in the wake of Boris Johnson being taken into ICU, we would often hear that COVID-19 does not discriminate. However, that is not borne out in the data. A recent study has shown that of those being treated in intensive care for coronavirus, a disproportionate number are from ethnic minorities. So we can go now to some stats written up in the Telegraph. So I see the extent of the, the problem, the issue. Uh, so it says, last week, data on patients with confirmed COVID-19 from the Intensive Care National Audit and Research Center suggested ethnic minorities are overrepresented compared with the general population. Of 1,966 patients with COVID-19, the ICNARC said 64.8% were white, 13.6% black, 13.8% Asian, and 6.6% were described as other. So that compares to uh, the general population where around 7.5% of the population were Asian and 3.3% black in the 2011 UK census. Now, those figures might have slightly changed since, since 2011, but certainly not enough to, to wipe out that disproportionate effect. Um, and we can see from, from those sums there, it seems as if black people are around four times more likely to end up in intensive care than the rest of the population and Asian people twice as likely. Um, more sort of anecdotal evidence for the, the extent to which this is disproportionately, COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting people from black and ethnic minority communities is that of the 12 doctors who have died after contracting COVID-19 so far, they're, all of the ones that are confirmed so far, all are from ethnic minorities. It's a pretty shocking statistic. Sonia, I just want to go to you for your sort of first thoughts on, on why you think this, this might be the case and what is the significance of these statistics? Yeah, so as you said, the government haven't published the ethnic breakdown of the deaths so far from coronavirus, um, but just looking at the healthcare workers that have died 68% of them are from the BME community, for people of colour. And to be honest, I don't think it's that surprising. Um, health inequality is not a new phenomenon. And, you know, we have decades of evidence in UK and in US that people of colour, um, BME people are more likely to have worse health outcomes, face barriers accessing healthcare, and are at greater risk of premature death. So, um, these, as shocking as these statistics are, I don't think it's that surprising given what we know about health inequalities um, in this country. Let's talk about the various explanations. So, I mean, and they're, they're all getting bandied about now. The government have said they're going to do an inquiry. We can talk about how, how serious that, that means they're really taking mm. it. But sort of of the various explanations, you've got the black and ethnic minority people work more in frontline jobs, that potentially it's connected to poverty and, and overcrowding in households, meaning that older people can't self-isolate from, from younger people, or the fact that people in people from South Asian communities often live in, in bigger households with different generations. Um, other suggestions have been about vitamin D. That's been sort of getting quite a lot of, of coverage in, in the media this week. I don't know what you 
What do you think about the the strength and weaknesses of these different answers, these different explanations um, for the differentials mm. that we're seeing? So obviously there's lots of reasons why, and it's multifactorial. Um, I think we need to, some of the reasons that we've heard by media commentators this week, and actually by some doctors going on the media talking about um, biological differences and innate genetic differences between people of color and white population are, um, first of all, unscientific, but also deeply problematic. Um, and I can explain, you know, black, in, um, black people and Asian people in the, in the UK and in the US are at higher risk of certain conditions, so at higher risk of getting diabetes, um, heart disease and hypertension. But we have to understand why they're at high risk. It's not due to um, genetics. It's due to the fact that certain um, social and economic circumstances can increase your risk of getting those diseases. So having a poor diet, um, not being able to exercise, just living in poverty, all increase those risks. Um, but also we have to look, there's, there's some really good research coming from US that shows that just experiencing everyday racism um, can increase your risk of having higher cortisol levels and then again having higher risk of having obesity, having higher risk of high blood pressure and diabetes. So actually racism has been shown to be a independent risk factor for having these conditions which then put you at a greater risk of being more severe COVID virus and actually dying from COVID virus. But then as you, as you said there are of course um, we know that your social and your economic circumstances will impact your health and also you're putting, putting you at one more risk of getting the virus. But again, so again, we know that particularly in London, you have more people of colour living in overcrowding, um, more certain ethnicities living in poverty, um, and more we have more BME people, people of colour working in precarious work, working in um, actually many of the sectors that are vital right now to keep this country going, but again, um, overrepresented in these workplaces. But again, we need to be asking why that is. Why is it that we have more workers of BME, BME more people of colour working in these um, precarious and low paid work? Um, and again, I think that stems down to racism as well. I mean, is, is there anything that in the short term can be done about this? Because I suppose there's two ways of looking at it. One, which is that sort of like the disproportionate impacts of, of COVID-19 demonstrate and bring to light the sort of existing structural inequalities in our society. But obviously in the middle of a pandemic, they aren't things which the government is, is going to be able to correct for or resolve. But what measures could the government be taking in the short or medium term that means that this burden isn't falling so heavily on, on black and ethnic minority communities? Yeah, I think it's um, in the very immediate, in the immediate, like in the next few weeks, we need to be thinking about um, how right now we are, what we're doing is in, 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 our, in our hospitals, um, certain health care, certain health conditions, if they are determining whether or not people get to go into ITU, according to for racial inequality, you are more, we can... <laughs> Essentially, we can get into a very difficult situation where you find that more BME people are not um, being, being having escalated that level of care. So we need to be careful mm. about that. Um, it's actually quite difficult to address this in the short term. Um, but I think something, and again, if you look at, again, the data of mortality, so if you're looking at um, why, why black women are more likely to die from heart, from um, in in childbirth, for example, so black women are five times more likely to die in childbirth than women, um, white women. And if you look at the academic research into this, one of the big factors is that healthcare professionals were not taking their symptoms of pain seriously. Again, we see this other research looking into um, BME women in London presenting with chest pain. Again, there was there were much more. Um, spending, they took much longer to get treatment for heart attacks than white women. Um, so it's a, this a predominant feature here is their, their pain and their symptoms not being taken, by, taken seriously by healthcare professionals. And something that was quite interesting that I read um, quite early on from a young black woman who, who died from coronavirus and the, the, the media reporting when it was speaking to her partner about it, he, he again said that he didn't feel her symptoms were being taken seriously when they were calling NHS 111, when they were calling the paramedics. So I think something, you know, unfortunately, racism within healthcare is very prevalent and is present. We often don't realise it as healthcare professionals, but we all have our own bias. So we do need to make sure that we are taking symptoms, um, everyone's symptoms seriously and being aware of our own unconscious bias there as well. 
And it, do you see, obviously you work in a healthcare setting, right? So you, mm. you you presumably might see these sort of things firsthand. Is this something that you're kind of aware of as a as an NHS worker, that people coming in of colour are treated differently to white people that, that come and present symptoms? I think you do see it if, you, if you're looking for it. It's, it's subtle, right? So I don't think doctors and nurses are going into the NHS and saying, you know, I'm not going to treat black people or I'm going to treat people of colour different to white people. It's not like that, but we all have our, we all have unconscious bias. Um, and I'll give you an example. So at the start of February, I started a new job, um, which only lasted a few weeks because of coronavirus, but I started a new job in, in psychiatry. Um, and we had some training um, from the psychiatrist about how to do a mental state examination. So this is basically you are um, documenting someone's mental state for other healthcare professionals to, to see. So you'd be documenting their speech, their behaviours, um, anything that could allude to how, if they are mentally unwell or not. And one of the things that you just document is their appearance. So you can document if they are unkempt, if they've not been looking after themselves. And then on the list of things to document, we're told to document their face, their skin colour. And, you know, I asked, I'm like, why, are we, why is this relevant to someone's mental illness, their, their skin colour? And I didn't really, wasn't given an answer. But so we are doing this all the time. Um, and actually, our medical curriculum is, is full of these, you know, race and ethnicity is, is, is there within our medical curriculum. And we're taught to think along these lines, whereas actually we know that race is not a biological category and um, the consequences of racism produced by have biological consequences but I think we need there has been within the medical cu curriculum this a sort of race and ethnicity and um, a confusion about that and actually so that needs to a sort of decolonizing of our curriculum something mm. that's is still needed and we're quite backwards with that I mean, I, I, one of the things I mentioned is that, you know, 12, the 12 doctors who have died have all been from BAME communities. I mean, one of the solutions to that is obviously going to be something which affects all medical staff, which is proper, adequate PPE on the front line. Um, so we're months into the coronavirus crisis and frontline workers are still struggling to access sufficient personal protective equipment or PPE. Um, 54 frontline health and social work care workers in England and Wales were confirmed to have died as of yesterday. And which really highlights how serious a problem this is. Today, there was a shift in the government's narrative as to why some frontline staff are short of PPE. Um, so to compare and contrast, to sort of see how the government narrative on this has changed, I want to go to Matt Hancock last Friday at the government press conference. There's enough PPE to go round, but only if it's used in line with our guidance. We need everyone to treat PPE like the precious resource that it is. That means only using it when there's a clinical need and not using more than is needed. So that suggestion, I think quite rightly, sparked quite a lot of outrage because the, the suggestion seemed to be that the reason frontline workers were struggling to get PPE was because some people, some frontline workers were using more than they needed. And that tone has slightly changed. This is Matt Hancock this morning speaking to the Health Select Committee. Given we have a global situation in which there is um, less PPE in the world than the world needs, um, obviously it's going to be a huge uh, pressure point. I mean, there's nothing that you can, um, uh, there's there's nothing that, that I can say at this select committee that will take away the fact that we have a global uh, challenge and we're doing everything that we can to resolve it to get that PPE to the front line. And so it's possible this admission of shortages, this change of tone, um, and the corresponding excuses for those shortages, in this case saying, oh, it's a global problem, it's on global supply chains, is because Matt Hancock knew that later to, later that day, so this afternoon, um, this story would break. Um, so we can get this up from The Guardian this afternoon. NHS staff to be asked to treat coronavirus patients without gowns. Um, so NHS bosses are preparing to ask doctors and nurses to work without full length gowns when treating COVID-19 patients as hospitals across England are set to run out of supplies within hours, The Guardian has learned. The guidance will be a reversal of Public Health England guidelines stipulating that full length waterproof surgical gowns designed to stop coronavirus droplets getting into someone's mouth or nose should be worn for all high risk hospital procedures. In a significant U-turn, PHE, so Public Health England, is set to advise frontline staff to wear a flimsy plastic apron when gowns have run out, in a move that doctors and nurses fear may lead to more of them contracting the virus and ultimately put lives at risk. Uh, so I want to go to you, Sonia, and sort of ask, you know, on a, on a practical level, obviously you've been working on the front line during 
um, the COVID-19 crisis. What has your experience been of, of PPE, both of, of yourself and, and other people in your, your workplace? Despite the government telling us on a weekly basis that they have loads of PPE, we know from frontline workers that there hasn't been enough PPE. Um, we know that hospitals are having to ration their PPE. Um, and it's just been infuriating week on week on week where we hear the government tell us about how much PPE is coming and we know it's not there. Um, I think this the scapegoating um, of healthcare workers for using too much PPE is uh, utter, utter nonsense, but actually it's not surprising from this government. They've been scapegoating other people for their failings from the start, whether it's um, single mothers going to the park or um, an old person sitting on a bench. They've been, they've, you know, scapegoating is something that they've been doing throughout this crisis. And actually, scapegoating is... is that the Tories scapegoating for their failings is not nothing new. And if we're talking back to back to BME, we know that for the past decade, them underfunding our healthcare service and then scapegoating migrants for, for that underfunding is again something that they've been doing. So we need to call it out. Um, I think actually in a way it's quite good today that he finally acknowledged that they don't have enough PPE because we've known this for the past few weeks, but it's just utterly utterly shameful that we are in this situation where you have health workers and care workers and wider NHS staff who are now having to how are putting their lives at risk on a daily basis because this government because of their incompetence really of not of not preparing for this virus. Often a, a worker in a workplace if they weren't receiving adequate protections if there wasn't the sort of statutory duty of care being sort of extended to them uh, they would have workplace representation. Now, I understand you've obviously got the Royal College of Nurses, you've got the British Medical Association. They're not trade unions, uh, but they are workplace mm. representatives. To what extent are they bringing up these issues with the government and saying this simply isn't good enough? So they are bringing up these issues. The BMA and the Royal College of Nursing have been bringing it up. Um, but I think we also need to understand that we are being put in a very difficult position. So I know trusts are putting out messages saying to doctors, if you don't have the full protective equipment, don't perform CPR. Um, so CPR is what you do when someone's heart stops or they stop breathing. But, you know, as a doctor, if I see someone and their heart stops, I'm not going to not jump on their chest because I don't have enough equipment there. So it's very, it's, it's in this type of situation where it's, it's life and death and you're caring for people, it's you can't just withhold your care. Um, so you know, unfortunately, healthcare workers and, and, and other staff are going to have to just continue working. Um, and yeah, people are putting their health and their lives at risk. And we talked about, we talked about before about, you know, people of colour and being me people. They are people that are, you know, predominantly, you know, who, who are at risk, as we explained, um, because of all these social and economic situations. And also, particularly if we look at our care workforce, mm. predominantly BME, but also, um, quite an elderly population um, and they are an at-risk group and that is why we have seen we have seen deaths of healthcare workers and care workers from this they're not even recording the number of people in the care sector that have died from this virus care workers mm. who have died from this virus and I just think that's shocking it's really really shocking um, we've had you know I just I, I, we've been we've had the virus in this country now for seven weeks so this is seven weeks where we've had workers and care workers in the workplace, putting their health and their lives at risk on a daily basis and putting at risk also their loved ones as well. Um, I don't really, I've, I'm beyond now words of how to describe my, my feelings on this, but it's just, it, it is utterly, utterly, utterly shameful place for us to be in. Um, and other countries did prepare. So other countries have prepared. Um, we, this country didn't, and our government needs to be held account for that. So, I mean, we we have a video over at Navarra Media on, on the YouTube channel. People are watching this on. Uh, I see Michael is struggling a little bit with his internet connection this evening. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's fine. I'm sure. I'm sure probably people are rinsing. Sort of internet connections are going to get increasingly difficult over the next couple of months. Is that? Do you think that's what it is? Is it that so many people are now trying to you know stream stuff off their laptops because no one is allowed to go out I on actually, Friday night? I know. I think. I think difficult. No, no. To... I think basic maintenance of network infrastructure is going to really suffer in the next couple of months. But anyway, I mean that's a separate point. I understand, you understand that the government might be sort of a step behind one, two, three weeks into this thing. But I, I want to understand sort of from a legal perspective, what if what if the government is found to be negligent in terms of the duty of care to uh, NHS staff, which is to say 
if the lack of the absence of gowns, the absence of proper PPE is found to have led to several thousand deaths in the National uh, Health Service, to, to what extent is is the is the government legally culpable for that? What, what would they would they be on the hook for compensation or medical claims, etc.? How, how is this working in terms of liability? Is it on the NHS staff or is it on the government? The problem is it's very difficult to know if some like for example i think i had had the virus a couple of weeks ago i don't know where i got that from so i could have got it from patients but i could have also got it just going on the bus to work so it's i think it's a difficult thing to prove direct causation of where where people are getting the virus from um so i can't really answer that but actually government incompetence in their policies leading to leading to deaths something that we've had for many years um and every healthcare worker that you'll speak to prior to this virus will, will, will have been in a situation where you've seen people be harmed and actually people die um, because of failures of care in the NHS, not, not having enough staff and underfunding and all these other things. So, and we've, I've never, I've not seen any prosecutions for that. So, you know, I'm not sure. I, I, I think, but I, I think it's probably going to be unlikely given what's, what we've seen in the past 10 years. Well, I say that right, because Sonia, I think we're, Oh, go on, go on, Michael. Oh. You lead. Well, I was going to say I think we're going to let Sonia get off because we've now go got on. we've got too many bad internet connections in the house. That it's getting mine's. Ah. I'm having problems. I think Sonia's also having problems. Well, we'll, we'll get but, her back on. Soon. No, you go in with your. Or you want to go in with your question, Aaron? Or no, no, it's just it's more of an observation. You know, in any workplace, if you knew you were, it's like you know, people have seen Chernobyl, the uh, HBO thing. They know that they're sending the workers into this toxic environment, and obviously the workers are doing a very noble thing, saving people's lives. But it's kind of a similar. A similar situation obviously not as dramatic you know this isn't radiation poisoning uh but uh, i think you know um in an additive sense thousands of workers in hundreds of locations are being subject to a, le a level of um danger they shouldn't they shouldn't be and ultimately public health england uh, the secretary of state for health the, the requisite nhs management are on the hook for this because they said in january february we were su sufficiently prepared and, and that's not true um, I think we are gonna we're gonna move on to our Labour Party leadership tittle tattle, um, which you're gonna be way too professional um, to to get involved in. You've got too too thing. many important things going on trying to save uh, the country from coronavirus. But it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on tonight's show. Thanks for having me. Stay safe. Yeah, 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 and keep in touch. See, tell us tell us if the PPE ever does properly turn up. I will do. <laughs> What the hell has happened we'll have to, to your get internet, back in the Michael? Studio sometime soon. What the hell um, has happened? Like, look, I'll take over, Michael. Goodness me, how many people okay. we got watching? Uh, we've got nine hundred seventy-four watching. Great, but only four hundred five thumbs. Smash the like button. And the juiciest stuff of all, of course, we've talked about the politically important stuff, which is PPE, which is the complete inability of the National Health Service to deal with the coronavirus. We're going to talk about stuff that you know on 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 face value. The Labour leaks stuff, uh, we've talked about it repeatedly on previous shows. You might think, well, Aaron, look, it's kind of grow up. That's not such a big story. But actually, when you think about it, in a democracy, one of the two major parties of government having senior staff actively trying to lose a general election is a huge story. You know, we don't need to look at the Kremlin or Moscow or Vladimir Putin in terms of undermining the sort of, you know, the, uh, the efficient working of our democracy we need to look at Southside and Labour HQ. Uh, so we'll be talking about that more for the rest of the show for the next 20 minutes. Uh, Michael is underwater. Freya North says, it's a huge story. I couldn't agree more. We just ran something this evening on uh, NavarraMedia.com about Emily Old now. Uh, I have confirmation that she was one of the leading candidates for the Starmer camp to replace Jenny Formby as Labour Party General Secretary. Uh, that's, that's now... Probably not likely, uh, given what she has said. Uh, but anyway, you're right. It's a huge story. Michael is back. Uh, let's talk a bit about your scoop today, Aaron. What was the mm. significance of 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 this story that you're saying that Emily Aldno was or Aldno was was going to be the next general secretary? Well, um, I mean, what or potentially she, she was in yeah. line for it. Very. I mean, top top two or three candidates, as one person said to me. Uh, what the quote the quote in the piece is being talked about and seriously. Um, she was on a shortlist, effectively. Uh, they hadn't got that far. Uh, and one other person, this isn't the piece, who's close to the sort of Starmer camp, said that Keir Starmer has never met or spoken to Emily Old. No, I mean, maybe that's possible. 
But the thing is, what we have to remember is that it, Keir Starmer isn't, in, you know, he's not a, a factional fighter. He's not really even a politician. He's only been in politics since 2015. Uh, this was being outsourced to various other people, and those people uh, had determined that Emily Oldner was a, a decent candidate, should be in the running. Well, I should say uh, that his chief of staff, Morgan McSweeney, uh, had question marks over her. So it wasn't like she was a shoe in uh, but she, she was being touted. Uh, and this is somebody who, as I think is made clear in the piece, uh, one should probably think she isn't that best qualified for the for the role. Should we go on to another awkward moment that Keir Starmer had yesterday? And I say this, go I'm going to I'm going to sort of caveat this by saying I have been thinking that maybe I should tweet and talk less about Keir Starmer because at the moment I I mean I have been a bit disappointed with his performance so far. But at the same time, you know, I want him to be a success. I don't want to seem like I'm just someone hating from the sidelines. Uh, but we're going to go to a couple of clips and then and then be very fair about him um, in in response to them. Um, so yesterday, Keir Starmer had a bit of an awkward moment in an interview with Laura Koonsberg and Adam Fleming on their coronavirus newscast. Um, we're going to go to the first clip now. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, um, I really hated selling myself into the membership and I much prefer um, having to take, you know, leadership decisions as leader of the Labour Party. But you hated so, the campaign. Uh, I'm much more comfortable at... Uh, I'm, I'm much more comfortable on this than I am in the in the campaign. But, you know, we've had difficult decisions because coronavirus now frames everything um, in terms of, you know, how we conduct ourselves. What the hell? Is this? Well, I mean, it's that, it's that, it sounds cynical, doesn't it? Because it sounds like what he's saying is um, I, I hated trying to appeal to the members. Now they voted for me. I can ignore them. Mm. Um, I think, you know, to be fair to him, we have to say he did kind of clarify afterwards what he meant so let's go to that now as well did you just say that, that you hated having to sell yourself to the membership is that because i mean what what, what do you mean what? do you not like the membership or is it that you don't like the kind of the salesman bit oh no i didn't say i didn't like no what i don't like is selling myself into right. the membership this constant um you know for all of our selections it's the same in all political parties you've got to go around selling yourself into the membership um, oh, so you and, just find that all a bit, sort of facing a bit the awkward. But what, yeah. what are you going to do yeah, when it comes to Yeah, I mean, you're doing, general... you're doing hustings. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, he, he's saying he doesn't hate the membership. It's a bit awkward. Then Laura Koonsberg at the end has quite a cutting. Where, I mean, you're going to have to sell yourself in a general election. Uh, his clarification after that was to say, no, I didn't like uh, the leadership election because I was competing with my, my yeah. comrades, who, yeah, yeah, who yeah. I quite like. Well, colleagues. Long Bailey right. and Lisa and Andy. Mm. And in a, yeah, co colleagues, not comrades. I wouldn't advise you to say comrades, to be honest, if you're the leader of the opposition. And you're talking to Laura Koonsberg. Um, but his, his colleagues, and if he was up against Boris Johnson, uh, then he would he would much prefer it. I mean, my first thought when I heard that clarification was, I mean, to be honest, he's just as collegiate with Boris Johnson as he ever was with with any of the the Labour leadership contenders. So I don't know, I don't know how much of a difference there's going to be, but I don't know. What did you make of this, Aaron? I thought it's I think it's terrifying. I think it's absolutely terrifying. Um, first of all, politics is about persuasion. Right, whether it's an internal political, and you can do that in a very civil way. You don't need to be abusive or obnoxious. Politics is about persuasion, persuading people to get with you. And a synonym for that is selling yourself, selling your ideas, uh, selling the political project you want to succeed because you think it's the best way for us as a society to, 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 to go about things in the future. Uh, and so the idea that somebody is in politics, they're the leader of the opposition, but they don't like the act of political persuasion is concerning. Now, if he was a Tory, maybe, you know, you don't have to do that as much. Uh, but as somebody in the Labour Party, even if you have a moderate prospectus for change, Tony Blair, for instance, you're going to have to do a lot of persuading. You can't just sort of look the part past what Robert Shrimsley, I think a very weak journalist, the Financial Times calls the first glance test, because people are going to glance a second, a third, a fourth, and a fifth time. So uh, it, it's concerning. You know, I'm, I feel much, yes, I feel much more comfortable at the apex of a political party with half a million members. That is not politics. Politics is about persuasion. You have to beat the Tories. The Tories have had hundreds of millions of pounds of funding over the last couple of years. They, they basically, they couldn't be closer to the print media in this country, although to be fair, many of those papers won't exist at the time of the next general election. So it's concerning for me. Uh, you know, I don't expect Keir Starmer to be like Jeremy Corbyn, you know, on a soapbox with a megaphone talking to any group, any time. I, I get that. He's a different kind of politician, but he's going to have to campaign and persuade. That's the bread and butter of politics, particularly for a Labour Party, which is, in his own words, 
going to adhere to significant parts of the 2017 manifesto next time round? You could say, I mean, again, to be you know incredibly sympathetic, you could say that what he was doing there is, well, show, uh, well, showing not telling in that you shouldn't really, there's no point in saying as a politician, you know, I love selling myself. Maybe he doesn't, maybe he does actually want to be persuasive and win elections and sell policies, but he's just not going to talk about it. I mean, the thing is, we haven't seen that over the past two weeks. He hasn't been showing not telling because there have been you know, many opportunities to make the political weather, right. be that about personal protective equipment or testing. Um, and he's chosen yeah, this this odd this odd move to just talk about exit strategy all the time, which to me, I mean, there's painful memories of the Brexit debate coming back to the fore because mm. his his exit strategy policy which is to say we want them to publish an exit strategy so that we can scrutinize it. But we have no particular opinions about what it should look like. We're not going to prejudge the outcome. Um, we just want it to be published. Um, and also the fact that once they've explained it, they have to clarify over and over again. No, that doesn't mean we want to end the lockdown. It doesn't mean we want to end the lockdown. It just means we want it published. And no, it doesn't mean we have a we have a we have an exit strategy that we want. It just, you know, it's it's this weird technocratic policy that no one understands. Um, that is quite at odds with the public mood because, you know, as Matt Singh, who's, uh, I don't know who he's with anyway, it's a pollster, but he was saying the lockdown is, you know, the, one of the most popular policies with the public in British history. So then to come out with a policy which is quite easily construed as counter to that, and also a bit of a, you know, well, it's not a danger to public health to ask for a for an extra it strategy, poly, but it's a thought... danger to public health to suggest it should happen. I thought, yeah, but I don't like, I, first of all, I don't like that guy, Matt, Matt Singh guy. And also it's not a policy. It's something people are consenting to. It's like saying that rationing in the second war was policy. It's not policy. It's having, it's, it's being policy. forced. It's not policy. It's a, it's a measure taken in an emergency situation. It, it, if people didn't consent to it, pe politics is about, if you want to win an election, you offer policies. People don't consent to policies. They vote for them. But like you're, you, there's no consent with regards to these policies because if it's about public health, it's about maintaining life. I don't. Th I think framing it as a policy is stupid. You know, broadband for everybody is a policy. It's a policy proposal. This is about an emergency, uh, a set of emergency measures and how you wish to sort of unwind them or how you wish to recalibrate them in the future. I think policy is a fucking stupid thing. But if the guys are pollster on Twitter. Would you expect? I, mean, you could have had, I just don't think that's the right I mean, word to use. What, I don't want to have a... in the next manifesto. It's always going to have a policy of fucking what. You know well, what I mean? Policies don't always have to be a manifesto. I mean, you can have a policy. number of policies when it comes to how you're going to, or, or just a measure. You want to call it a measure then, but this is semantic. It doesn't make a difference. No, no, no I, think is, it, the, I don't think it's the, semantic. The lockdown as a measure. There was an alternative. The alternative was to have a much more liberal, liberal situation, which is what Boris Johnson was originally planning. He thought it would be more popular to let 100,000 people die and have people continue their day-to-day -day lives and people be able to go to the pub. He, he thought that was going to be what the British people would want. Turned out, no, it turned out that actually the lockdown became an incredibly popular measure, you know, and and where there's overwhelming consent. And that was very surprising to the government. So we shouldn't take it as a given um, that because it is medically necessary, it was never going to be subject to contentious politics. But people, but no, but people, people are dying. Again, it's about what do, you call, what do you mean by popular? People are dying. So people understand and accept you have to take incredibly dramatic and drastic measures. And I agree with you far more than the government realized. I agree with you. Mm. Um, is that I don't I wouldn't call that popular. People understand the extent and the profundity of the problem. It's not people aren't clamoring. I want to stay locked up for as long as possible. Nobody's saying that. Pop, that's what popularity means. So I just think it's a weird term to use. I agree. I agree with the fundamental point that Starmer going for this exit strategy thing, given that people are consenting to this you know, this thing, and you know it's not they're not like we need to get out of this as soon as possible. I agree with that, uh, but I, I just think popularity is a, is an odd thing to say. And I know I've gone, I've gone this in about, about this in a strange way because actually I fundamentally agree with the point, but I, I also just thought the frame. <laughs> no, but I just thought the framing of that was really was really odd. Well, no, it's, I mean, nobody, it's just, nobody's I, like, please, I'll oh, please, oh, please, they go to that. Please, no, I just, I, I'm, I'm desperate for this I lockdown to last have, as long as possible. Nobody saying. I think people have really embraced it and identified with it. One of the reasons I say this, and I'm I'm also worried that it's going to be a bit of a cultural element here, um, because, and it was Will Davis pointed it out actually a couple of weeks ago when. Victoria Park got closed. So that's my local park in, in Hackney. When that got closed, everyone on Twitter was outraged, right? Because um, they were saying, look, it's, it's irrational to close this park, for one, because we can socially distance out there. Two, it's sort of the government scapegoating um, ordinary people for their own prior failure. And, you know, it seemed like, oh, that was the consensus. Then a week later, not necessarily because of the Twitter backlash, 
Hackney Council, or actually it's Tower Hamlets Council who control Victoria Park, even though it cuts across both boroughs. They reopened it. Then you look on Facebook, and Facebook is full of people saying, this is outrageous. This is just because the hipsters wanted to run around the park. But who's We're saying in a national it? emergency. People, people in Hackney? Who's saying it? People that live in Tower Hamlets in Hackney. So local residents is in like a sort of Hackney life thing. But I think there is a sort of, I think there is a, a demographic that have embraced the lockdown. Um, and that demographic is incredibly broad, but it is also, you know, not so much the Keir Starmer demographic, more more Brexity. Because I it also has a sort of like, it, also, it has a sort of authoritarian sort of like, we're all in this for the public good and a sort of, a, a sort of pleasure. I don't think that's uh, true. A lot of sort the, of lot, guilting people who are going out for a, runs. A lot of the Brexit contrarians uh, are like, no, this needs to not happen. People like Julia Hartley Brewer is like, this is, this is a originally she's like, this is a terrible idea. We shouldn't do this. So I'm yeah, not but that's quite... the difference. But that's the difference between. So there's always been a sort of inherent divide and inherent division between in the, within the Brexit coalition between the Adam Smith Institute type people who wanted Brexit mm. as a so Adam Smith Institute they want open borders and Brexit as an opportunity to have incredibly low regulation and they're the ones who wanted the herd immunity strategy which is you know do this odd utilitarian calculus and say we should let the old people die if it means that we get economic growth um, and the more popular sort of small c socially conservative bit of an authoritarian tendency they wanted Brexit for closed the borders and, and more national sovereignty. And those guys are really into the lockdown. I just don't... Really I mean, into I, the lockdown. I, 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 so I think, think it's very politically uh, dangerous for Keir Starmer to position himself against it. No, I agree with that partially. Okay, I think, again, we're cross, we're sort of crossing, talking across each other here. I, I think most people are very happy to consent to it because they realise it's necessary and they're observing the rules to a significant extent. I don't think they're really into it. I don't think they're like, there, this is my thing. But I do agree with you. There is also a subset of people who... Actually, probably they don't adhere to the rules any more than than the rest of us. Uh, but they're, they're, there's a performance, there's a performance element to it. I agree with that. Uh, I, I think the reason why people, have, I think Britain fundamentally is actually quite a, a collectivist society. I think people are actually given to cooperation in Britain far more yeah. than far more than we're, we're told by our, our political class. And we can talk about the reasons why. Probably the 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 inheritance of the Second World War. Uh, the fact we've still got a very you know integrated national schooling system. Public healthcare, etc. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think it's necessarily bad. I, I do agree there's a socially conservative element to it, but I think there's also just lo lots of the national mythos is based about uh, around people coming together in a way that in America it isn't. You know, and people are like this is America. I can go to Times Square and fucking get COVID nineteen if I want to. In Britain, people are like, what the fuck are you talking about? Sorry, so you, uh, you know, uh, but you know, people people would be like, "This is bizarre." Why do you think freedom is becoming ill? People going in the United States first thing is buy guns. People are like, "What? This is kind of weird." So I, th I think it does channel a certain sort of cultural set of mores, which aren't necessarily socially conservative. Although I agree, there's significant overlap there. But I, we both agree the sort of Keir Starmer obsession with the exit strategy thing. It's just it sounds like the Brexit test. It's just like process and procedure, and it's performative and doesn't really mean very much. And I, I don't really get how it's opposition. All right, we're going to do a shorter show than usual because of technical problems today, but we're going to go to a couple of audience questions. Um, first, we've got a good question. Sean McHale, do you wish Nandy had won now? At least she's straight talking. Aaron? Do I wish at least Nandy had won? Yeah. No. no? I think he's, I think Keir Starmer, look, Keir Starmer won. He was the best candidate. That's the reality of it. I don't think he's a particularly outstanding politician. He may improve. Jeremy Corbyn improved significantly as a politician, particularly between 2015 and 2017. Matt, like, I mean, it's also, it is also worth remembering that Keir Starmer had a very good CV, but he is a very new politician. He's only yeah. been a politician since since 2015. Um, and he hasn't really had to scope out his own, you know, personality during that because he was, you know, he always confined himself to this sort of almost apolitical technocrat role, yeah. sort of constructing Labour's Brexit test, which was really bringing out the lawyer in him. So I don't think he has been tested as a politician as opposed to a lawyer. So he probably will learn on the job. He's a clever guy. Yeah. But here's the question for you, Michael. Yep. Somebody like a David Lammy or a Clive Lewis or a Jess Phillips, because they've not had a senior role, they could sort of cultivate that persona in a way that Keir Starmer couldn't, Rebecca Long Bailey couldn't, because they were thrust straight into really serious jobs. Mm. Now, the question is, if Keir Starmer had been on the backbenches, would he have done that? But, uh, and so his response to that mm. question on the telly today, or on that podcast, sorry, was it today or yesterday? It was today, wasn't it? Um, 
makes you think he he just sort of doesn't think that that kind of thing of building a political brand a persona is his is his thing i mean maybe he did, maybe he doesn't think he has to do it in politics and it's kind of like there are lots of gaps in Keir Starmer which i think mm. because he's a cipher people are people are sort of sort of projecting all sorts of stuff onto him what what does he think in terms of political economy what does he think we we have no we idea don't know. I mean, boring people have won elections, though. So if he's going to be the sort of competent, reassuring Ooh. bureaucrat, what boring people have won elections? John Major was very boring. John Major had been a had been a, a, a had been a chancellor before he was the prime minister. I don't think Keir Starmer knows what he wants from the economy. I don't. I don't think mm. he's interested in political economy. You know, whereas right, John ne- McDonnell, Jeremy Corbyn, they you know you might not like them. They they thought we'll use surplus, you know, the deficit spending to pay for X, Y, Z, or we'll you know we need to do this with regards to foreign trade, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's not Keir Starmer's world. Uh, final question, John Smith: Is Starmer's push for an exit strategy indicative of him appeasing big business over the health of ordinary workers? What do you think? No, so I don't. I don't think it's as cynical as that. I, I mean, I I think it was a policy which is too clever by half and is constructed by people who don't really have much sense of the public mood. Um, I mean, Stephen, we talked about it on on an earlier show. What Stephen Bush suggested is they're trying to cover their backs for when we have to pay back the debts um, from the coronavirus lockdown. And they want to say, well, you can't blame us for the debts because we tried to get you to, you know, plan for a, a lockdown exit sooner. Now that says, I hope that's not their strategy because that would be accepting the logic of austerity, where what we actually need um, is to have a sensible conversation about the fact that we don't actually have to construct public policy around paying back this debt which we owe to, in many cases, you know, the Bank of England or, mm. or you know, very long-term bonds that aren't going to mature for a very long time. Yeah. So. So, I mean, if, if that's what he's thinking about, that would be stupid. Um, I, I mean, I think, and this was someone replied to me on, on Twitter with this this week, I think that the, the best explanation is that they think this is one position they can take which doesn't oppose the government, but which sort of moves the debate forward and, and gives them, puts them on the front foot because they know that exit strategy is what's going to be the next debate and they want to get themselves out there. Also, Keir Starmer is only comfortable doing process and this allows them to do that. I mean, look, they're all bad reasons. But. I mean, like I've said, Keir Starmer won the election, the leadership election. He deserved to win it. He was the best candidate. Rebecca Long Bailey just ran a really bad campaign. She's a decent politician. She ran a really bad campaign. Lisa Nandy didn't have the resources, you know, the story behind her. I voted for Rebecca Long Bailey because I agree with her political program, uh, reluctantly, has to be said. Uh, but Keir Starmer, in terms of a package, I think he, he deserved to win. He had the best campaign. He had the best campaign materials. He had the most money. You can disagree with that and so on. Um, but uh, I, I just think we're looking at a great lawyer and great lawyers don't make great political strategists. I think they're two different skills. Uh, and I think I think he's really, really, really out of his depth. I really fear he's out of his depth. And I really want him to win the next general election. And it's going to get tiresome for people watching this thinking, oh, God, Aaron's knocking fucking Gear Starmer. Look, I don't want to knock him. I just think people say, oh, he's like Ed Miliband. I actually think Ed Miliband had a more worked out sort of political agenda. I just think there were countervailing factors which stopped that. Uh, and and I, it, uh, th- there are good things with Starmer. One is, for instance, like I say, the loyally uh, demeanor. He believes in due process, which means in regards to the Labour leaks, I trust him to a significant extent, far more than I would, say, Lisa Nandy, in terms of resolving this and instituting healthy professional practices at, at Labour Party headquarters. But in terms of political strategy, in terms of telling a story, which means that we come out the other end of coronavirus with a more progressive political common sense, I, I, don't, I don't think he's the best, the best person to do that, frankly. All right, we are going to end tonight's show there. My apologies for the technological problems we've had this evening. Uh, I think a large part of that was my internet connection, which you know is very disappointing. I'll make sure that is sorted by Monday, so you never have to see a glitchy host again. Terrible, um, you know. I, I know I that's say- not what you tune in for. I, f- I feel embarrassed, Aaron, that people Look, had to watch. You, a, a you've been hosting. No, no, evening. no. You've been hosting a. You've been hosting a great. Can I just say, Michael, you've been MVP, Navarra's MVP. Uh, you've Thank been you hosting. I, a- I needed that tonight, Aaron. You've been hosting a great show, so that was always going to happen. But what I just want to say to our viewers is. Look, we've got 1,120 watching, only 672 thumbs. What's going to make Michael feel great is this, get, this gets 1,000 likes. Uh, <laughs> Even if know, it was glitchy. Before 10 o'clock. Well, no, you look great now. It's kind of weird, which, I mean, surely by Monday I'll be fine, I guess. Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, Aaron, you've been great. My and pleasure. your connection's been fabulous. So it's sort of like a double, a double whammy there. Uh, 
and thank you for watching this evening's show. We'll be back on Monday night, most likely uh, with John McDonnell. Uh, he's going to be talking about the Labour leaks, his take on, on Keir Starmer. I mean, I'm sure we don't. I, I, I doubt we're going to get any huge scoops of him sort of dishing the dirt on Keir Starmer because he's a very collegiate, comradely uh, person. But I think his, his opinions on the Labour leaks have been quite, you know, strong and forthright up to, mm. up to now. I think that could be a really good show. Uh, so have a wonderful weekend. Uh, don't go outside or not for more than your one hour's allotted exercise um, and see you on Monday evening.